Hey everyone, I should theoretically be live here, Monday, open space. Uh, this is of course your chance to ask me any questions you might have about space and astronomy, any topic whatsoever, stuff that's happening in the news that you've been watching, uh, bring them all and let's uh, tackle them. I'll get through as many questions as I can. As always, you control the show, not me. I am but a humble servant. Um, uh, if you missed it, we had a pretty great virtual star party. Um, I know it's hard to tell the, the you know, the, the difference, but we I think we had like one of the nicest live views of Mars uh, we've ever seen. And um, that was from Molly and it was uh, pretty amazing. So uh, if you haven't had a chance, it's like right at the beginning of the show, so you just quick check the latest virtual star party uh, and it was incredible. So, uh, and some other good pictures too. Um, so yeah check that out. Um, all right, let's get into the questions. Of course, if you're watching, go ahead and just put a question into the chat. Uh, if you put a question mark in front of it, that'll make it easier for me to catch the questions as you as you ask them, as well as the uh, moderators who are actually copy pasting them. When I'm looking up, I'm looking up at the questions uh, that have been posted. So I'll start with the Pykel Malmer, <laughs> um, which asks uh, what percentage of oxygen in the air makes being alive too difficult um and you there's no limit to the amount of oxygen in the air that that would make being alive too difficult in fact when the astronauts go on their spacewalks they use 100 percent pure oxygen and as opposed to a standard oxygen mix that we use. I don't know if that's to not get the bends, uh, like the way divers do with changes in pressure. Um, but yeah, so they're going on full oxygen. And so the human body can absolutely handle, of course, if you're having prob problems breathing, then they increase the amount of oxygen that you uh, get uh, so that you can have an easier time breathing. The problem is that the more oxygen there is in the atmosphere, the easier it is for things to light on fire. And so planet wide, we are pretty much exactly at the point of nicely balancing the most amount of oxygen that we would want to have in our atmosphere. If we have more oxygen, then things burn. And that helps reduce the amount of oxygen back down to this sort of perfect balancing point. So we as life forms can enjoy more oxygen, but um, our, you know, everything would be on fire. Of course, this was a this was one of the problems that happened with the Apollo one spacecraft, the Apollo one test, the astronauts went into their capsule, they were pumping in 100% oxygen and some electric sparks caught some cloth on fire inside the capsule and the astronauts burned alive. So, um, you know, having pure oxygen creates a very flammable environment. And so it's very, very risky to do. Um, all right, so let's see here. <laughs> Fisto Tutti, do Falcon 9 first stages really land on a barge? The camera always malfunctions. Or have you actually seen it? Uh, it, it is a sort of a funny coincidence that every time a Falcon 9 mission is Falcon 9 uh, booster stage is returning back to the drone ship, the camera cut, cuts out for a second. Um, and I'm assuming that just has something to do with the fact that there's a gigantic flaming rocket getting very close and, and uh, causing havoc on the on the drone ship. I, I haven't like gone through and analyzed every single one of them and said like, you know, have, have, has the camera always cut out? Um, but are you like claiming it's some kind of conspiracy theory? Cause I mean like a rocket takes off and a, uh, and a drone ship returns with a rocket on board the first stage and then they put it on another one. So I don't know where they're going. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh it's a, I don't know if it's a coincidence or it's just like part of how, when the rocket is arriving on the drone ship, it messes up with the cameras. So you get that cut out for a second. Arjone, 
could SpaceX have gotten to this point eventually without NASA? Do a lot of ex NASA people work there? I don't know how many people work at NASA, but could SpaceX have gotten to where they are without NASA? I'm going to say no. Um, NASA was really SpaceX's first and biggest customer to provide them with funding. And, and Elon Musk said that if their first rocket had failed one more time, the whole company would have been a, would have gone out of business. So he, he didn't have enough money to fund the company um, without the injection of funds from NASA uh, to really just be their first customer and to be their best customer. I mean, still to this day, NASA buys all kinds of flights. And now, of course, we've seen the second flight, uh, the second Dragon flight carrying astronauts to the International Space Station and and all of the cargo Dragon flights. NASA is a huge customer of of SpaceX. At this point, SpaceX could probably survive without NASA with other commercial clients as well as what they're doing with Starlink. But really, they absolutely needed NASA in the beginning. And it's it's so funny to me that people give. I don't know, it's like people say like, Oh, you know, NASA is so dumb. SpaceX is the future. NASA should just get out of the way. It's a partnership. Um, it's like NASA is the customer. And SpaceX is the provider. NASA builds the satellites. And SpaceX provides the rocket ship for the satellite, um, or, or NASA provides the astronauts and SpaceX provides the ride to space. So without NASA, SpaceX wouldn't have the customer and without SpaceX, NASA would have a far more expensive ride to orbit. So the two work really well together. I can imagine people thinking that there's a problem with, say, um, uh, you know, SLS versus Falcon Heavy and some of the things like that, like, like maybe NASA should be spending more money on SpaceX launches and less money on other launch providers. Uh, but that's that's a market thing. And that'll work itself out over the long term. If SpaceX can continue to take over more and more of the launch market, then it's going to be a lot more difficult for the other providers like United Launch Alliance, um, Antares, things like that, Cygnus to be able to compete with them. And we'll see what happens when if Blue Origin comes along and makes it hard for SpaceX to compete with them. So more launch providers are a good thing. I mean, we got to this place by not having good strong competition. And now we do and it's a it's a it's a great time. Um, Visto Tutti, if space launch system is delayed again, does the Lunar Gateway get delayed as well? Uh, it all depends. I, I think I talked about this a bit last week that we are in a very precarious phase of the Artemis mission. Of course, there's going to be a changing administration. Who knows what priorities uh, the new administration is going to put on having humans go to the moon. I think, you know, at this point, the Artemis mission is, is the plan. The question is, do you just go with quickly returning back to the moon boots on the ground, plant a couple of flags, return back to Earth, but not build any of that infrastructure? Or do you build the lunar gateway, fly to the gateway, fly from the gateway down to the moon and have more of a uh, of a more sort of established return presence going to and from the moon. And, and right now, you know, we don't know what the changing administration's budget who the new administrator of NASA is going to be. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with the space launch system. We don't know what Congress is going to do what the Senate is going to do. Um, so everything is sort of in flux right now. I if I was to sort of place my bets, my guess is that we will see a return to the moon, not by 2024, thanks to the pandemic and, and very, you know, a, a lack of funding to NASA for the Artemis mission. I mean, that's part of the other problem as well is that NASA just didn't get the money to, to fulfill on all of the goals that were required. I mean, we, we talked to, you know, we talked to all kinds of people in various departments and they're, you know, they're expected to build a spacesuit or they're expected to build 
capsules and rocket engines and things like that. And the funding isn't flowing into them the way it should. So uh, my guess is that we're going to see Artemis get delayed. I mean, there's no one has officially said this yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see Artemis get delayed to 2026 or 2027 or, or whatever. I mean, uh, it just, it always takes longer than you think. <laughs> um, uh, especially when we're talking about human beings. So, uh, at this point, you know, will space launch system, you know, I've, I've maintained for quite a while that I don't think space launch system is going to fly very often. <clears throat> it's going to fly at least once to test. It's going to fly probably a couple more times to launch some heavy parts into space. Like maybe they're going to launch the, the lunar gateway. And then I, I think that commercial providers are going to take over from that point. So that's that's sort of where my gut is telling me right now. But but right now, I mean, the official line is space launch, <clears throat> space launch system is going to be launching next year. Um, the first Artemis mission is going to be 2024 humans on the moon. Uh, and then the major parts of the lunar gateway will come online by that time or a little afterwards. So until the official line changes, uh, that's the plan right now. Um, let's see, apologies. Um, <laughs> you nerd, when was the last time you were too drunk to control your telescope properly? Um, I, I don't think it's possible. You know, it's pretty easy to punch in a bunch of locations on a computer and have it swing to its location. Um, and, uh, so it's, it's possible that I have been, <laughs> been drunk operating a telescope, not live on the star parties, but it's, you know, it's, it's happened in the past, you know, I, I mean, it's bringing the telescope, you know, you're at a party and, and showing people uh, cool objects in the night sky when they're, you know, perhaps a little affected. They're a little, um, a little open to new experiences. You're like, Hey, everybody, the international space station is going to fly overhead. And everyone's like, what? And then it flies overhead. Or you notice that there's an Aurora in the sky, the kind of thing we could see here in Canada, or you know where the planets are and you're like, Hey, everybody, that's Jupiter and that's Saturn. And if you've got the binoculars or a telescope out, you can start showing people. So I, it's possible that I have, I have either taken a telescope to a party. I'm going to hit at parties. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, Giro the hero says if the universe is heating up, does that implication for the end of the universe mean that we could have a big bounce instead of the heat death? So, so great. Um, you know, you're bringing a fairly new piece of research. Uh, we just talked about this on universe today, just a couple of days ago and new research says that the universe is heating up. Uh, by a factor of a thousand over the last 10 billion years. But it's really important to understand exactly what's being said here. So if you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the temperature of the essentially the the first moment that light could escape out into the universe, it's a, just a couple of degrees above absolute zero. It was it was 5000 degrees uh, no, 3000 degrees. Anyway, it was, it was like the temperature of a red star, um, back at the beginning of the universe. And then it slowly cooled down. And as we look in all directions, it's cooling down and it's just going to keep on cooling down until it reaches the background temperature. It's going to reach as, as close to absolute zero as you can literally get. But researchers have been measuring the temperature of the gas that surrounds galaxies. And the farther they look, the, the lower temperature that gas is. So around the Milky Way, the gases are like 2.5 million degrees um, Celsius, Kelvin. But if you go farther and farther out into space, all the way to 10 billion light years away. And of course, that's the magic of astronomy is that you can look outward in space. And as you look farther and farther away, you're looking farther back in time or further back in time. And so you can look at a galaxy that is, that is 10 billion light years old. And so you can check its temperature. And what astronomers are finding is as you go farther and farther away from the Milky Way, from, you know, from our point, our, our observable universe, 
every, that, that gas that's coming out is getting cooler and cooler. And what's happening is you've got all of these galaxy clusters that are coming together, these galaxies coming together. And as they do, as they heat up the gas that surrounds them. And just over time, as more and more gravity is pulling these, these large clusters together, this gas is heating up and heating up and heating up. And the same thing is, is happening here. Like right now we've got the Milky Way and Andromeda and Triangulum and like another 60 dwarf galaxies. And over the coming billions of years, all of those are just gonna come together into one big galaxy. And as this all happens, all this gas that's sort of a part of all these galaxies is going to heat up and heat up and heat up until eventually there's nothing left to come together anymore. And then they'll start to cool down. So um, it doesn't change the heat death plan because at the largest scale, the universe is still cooling down. And right now it's just temporary while everything that can come together will come together and then eventually everything is going to cool down again. Um, <laughs> Chris Caps, uh, why the rush to Mars when we have decades of technology to prove out and can do so on the conveniently close moon? Mars seems an order of magnitude more dangerous and difficult than the moon. Um, I, you know, I don't know, why can I not? There, gravity wells are for suckers. My opinion is uh, to never go into another gravity well. That once you have um, uh, gone out of the Earth's gravity well, why would you go back into another gravity well? Uh, let's say it takes you seven, what is it, like eight and a half kilometers per second escape velocity to go into orbit around the Earth while you need like two and a half to get away from the moon, you need five to get away from Mars. Um, gravity wells are terrible. So don't go into any of them. Uh, that said, uh, why go to the moon? Why go to Mars? Uh, Mars is the place that we could reach that is the most Earth like it has ground and a thin atmosphere and building materials and sunlight and uh, and the possibility that there has is life now or was life in the past. Um, the moon is close. And so if there's any disasters, you can reach the astronauts on the moon quickly and send them more toilet paper or whatever they need. So they all have their advantages and their disadvantages. I think in the medium term, I would like to see, uh, you know, a permanently inhabited research station on both the moon and Mars in whatever um, order makes the most sense. My guess is moon first, then Mars. Um, and, and we will ha just like right now, we can look up the International Space Station and know that there are people up there and have been there for 20 years, we can look up at the moon and go, Hey, there's people living up on the moon and they're regularly going back and forth and they're doing really interesting research on the moon. And oh yeah. And you look at Mars and you know, there's people on Mars and they're regularly going back and forth to Mars and doing really interesting research on the surface of Mars looking for life. I think the, the, you know, the part where I, where I disagree is I don't think either of those places are worth living on compared to earth, like, um, anything you want to do on Mars, you can do on earth. And then you can do a whole bunch of things on earth that you can't do on Mars. Okay, fine. You can't jump three times as high. That's it. I think that's it. Or like expose yourself to cosmic radiation. So, uh, that's my, um, and I think, you know, there will come some time, I mean, in the far, far future where people will where the technology will trivialize anything we want to do. You want to live in space? No problem. You want to live on the moon? Go ahead. You want to live on Mars? No problem. You want to live on Titan? Sure. Um, but until then, until the technology trivializes this existence, um, it's going to be just awful trying to live in any of those places. Um, so, so Kim asks, why is it useful to do research about something that will happen when all life on earth is death? 
So I guess you're asking why should we research things about the future that will happen perhaps after the sun has heated up the earth and the Milky Way has collided with Andromeda and curiosity. That's it. Why do we want to know the answers to these questions? Because we ask the question, what, what will happen to the future of the universe? I don't know. Let's find out, huh? You know, here's some interesting answers to that really interesting question. That's it. There's no practical reason. It's just, you know, um, people are, are curious about the question. And as scientists, as astronomers, they get to decide what they want to look into. And if they can convince other people that it's an interesting enough question, then they can get telescope time to do it as well. Um, and you never know. I mean, one of the things about basic research is that we never know what the future holds. We know we don't know which things that we investigate end up being really practical and which ones end up being just purely theoretical. Um, uh, you know, when people were researching into optics and lasers, they didn't know that eventually lasers would be just the basis of everything or silicon or um, semiconductors or all this kind of stuff. We just don't know. And so imagine that there's some researcher that is researching some kind, you know, the nature of space time, and they realize that the that in fact, there's some way that we could accidentally tear open a hole in space time if we just you know, post too many cat videos on YouTube or something. And we can warn everybody and we can stop that from happening and save the earth from being torn open by space time. So we don't know what the results of basic research is. The goal is that we just be curious. Of course, when I say that, I mean, we know of a thing that human humanity is doing that's going to cause grief to the planet Earth and people, scientists have been trying to warn us and nothing really seems to be happening. So anyway, moving on. Um, Tox Trader, could we achieve high speeds in space by using a railgun to launch a probe from space? Uh, yeah, so a railgun is a way of essentially just just accelerating a a payload to high velocity using electricity, uh, electromagnetism instead of a propellant. And so you have an asteroid and you put you build a little probe on the asteroid and then you put it on the railgun and then you accelerate it down the track and launch it off into space the asteroid gets pushed in the opposite direction a little bit, which can be good or bad. I mean, if you want to um, redirect the location of your asteroid, that's great. Uh, you can launch your spacecraft at very high velocity uh, and away it goes. And then if you've tar aimed it nicely or it's got some additional propellant on board so that it can change its direction, then away you go. Uh, it would be it wouldn't work from Earth, but it would definitely work from because you would just hit the brick wall of the of the atmosphere. And so you would if you tried to launch something, you know, it's always this question like, you know, could Superman punch somebody into space? And the answer is no, because if he could, you know, hitting somebody that quickly, you'd have to get them going immediately at escape velocity, which would have them burn up in the atmosphere. So um, and then the other thing is, is that you can't put something into orbit with a single kick. So so if you have a railgun that is launching some probe, and you want it to go into orbit around say, the moon, uh, it still needs to have some kind of propellant on board to be able to enter a capture trajectory around the moon. So it gets you a lot of the way there, but it doesn't get you all the way there. Um, and if, you know, when people are asking, like, could you send this stuff back to Earth? Sure. Um, you could build a, uh, you could have a, a, I don't know, like some kind of manufacturing facility on, on some near Earth asteroid, and there's a big rail gun on it. And the facility is build, builds, I don't know, 
fiber optic cable at incredibly long, you know, incredible purity, and then builds a re-entry vehicle and then blasts it back towards Earth. And then these re-entry vehicles enter the Earth's atmosphere and land nice and safe. And then people will open them up and enjoy the sweet, sweet fiber optic cables. Uh, the, you know, I can imagine some future civilization that has some sort of relay network that is using rail guns to kick things around to give things different amounts of velocity across the entire solar system. And that and that moves to that idea where, you know, at a certain point, the technology trivializes our existence in space. And and these are all going to be the pieces that get us there. So it's it's a lot more energy efficient for you to have a electromagnetic railgun fire something than to um, uh, you know to try and harvest propellant and put it into tanks and keep it in a in you know cryogenic uh, coolant and then have it function et cetera et cetera to just like just put it on the rail and fire it away way it goes. Um, Uh, Nico D S B C. When I imagine something in space, I suddenly fear to die, since the environment I'm imagining couldn't keep me alive. Do you have that? Anyone else? Um, I, it, you know, it's one of those ideas. You know, when you sort of, when you think about just the, like vastness of the cosmos, you sort of get overwhelmed. You're like, man, it's really big and spacey, and and. You know, people always talk about how the universe is perfect for life, but the universe really isn't perfect for life. There's almost all of it is is instantly hostile to life. The only place that we know of that is not perfect or that is like kind of OK for life is the Earth. And even on the Earth, you go a couple of kilometers below the surface and it's not good for life. You go a few tens of kilometers above the surface and it's not good for life. You go to the coldest places and it sucks. You go to the hottest places and it sucks. There's really just this tiny little layer that's safe for us to be in. And, and I think that, and I don't, I, you know, I've, I've never actually asked to an astronaut, like I never actually asked an astronaut about that, but I would imagine knowing that you're in say crew dragon or you're in the international space station and this far away from you, just on the other side of that, that tin can that you're inside is instant death. Like, does that make you go a little crazy? And I'm sure as more and more people have a chance to go out in space, some people will, uh, will be overwhelmed by the anxiety of it kind of in the same way that people are terrified when they fly on an airplane and you sort of think for a second, wait a minute, I'm going 700 kilometers an hour. And if this plane fails, I'm a goner. Or when you're on a boat and you're like, I'm here, I am above thousands of meters of ocean floor. And if this boat sinks, I'm swimming. So, um, yeah, I mean, all those kinds of things. And you just, you trust in the engineer and you trust in the capabilities of, of everybody who, who put their heart and soul into building this. So I know what you mean, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a big problem. I think, uh, people, tourists off to the moon for the first time are going to just lose it. <laughs> so I think we should be ready for that. Um, <laughs> sorry, dust man. Why don't we send a swarm of CubeSats in every direction? Uh, the problem with sending spacecraft far and wide in the solar system is that it's difficult to communicate with them. Um, Elon Musk launched his Tesla Roadster off to Mars and we'll never be able to talk to it again because nobody built a gigantic communication system onto the onto the roadster um 
there was this really cool idea that I saw where, where someone would send a fleet of CubeSats off to various places across the solar system, and then they would all orbit back. And so they would, they would all fly off to the asteroid belt and gather, take a whole bunch of pictures and gather a whole bunch of data, but they wouldn't be able to communicate. And then only when they finally got back to the Earth, would they be able to transmit their data, and then they'd go back out and find more targets and, and keep doing that. So CubeSats were great communicating them here on Earth. Uh, there have been some CubeSats that were sent to Mars, and they worked pretty well. So so that's not a terrible idea. Um, the other part is just giving each CubeSat its own separate trajectory. You know, you, you launch your rocket towards Mars and all of the CubeSats that are going to be on the on the launch vehicle are going to Mars. And they're not going to have their own little rocket booster that's going to take them in a different direction. They're all going to Mars. And so you would need to be able to send these CubeSats in lots of different directions, you would need to have um, different, uh, a different launch vehicle, different upper stage for each one of them. Uh, the one idea that I do like is this idea of the breakthrough starshot, wouldn't it be cool if we had little tiny spaceships that we could zap with a laser and then yeah you could you could you could have one hovering in front of the laser laser turns zap and then away your little probe goes to venus or mars or saturn or jupiter or the kuiper belt or whatever um i think it would be fantastic and but we just need that technology to, to come along Uh, Michael Moore is asking, have I looked into Craig Davidson's shark fin magnetic sail? Uh, I have not. I mean, I've looked at, at magnetic sails in general, um, but I haven't looked at that very specific one. So if you could put a link in the chat, that would be great. Um, all right. So apologies, I'm uh... so A.V. Scott and Flowers asking uh, what specific process would be needed to alleviate the pressure in the atmosphere of Venus and also chemically process and nullify the sulfuric acid? Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, people always ask, like, how could you know, Venus is the worst, you know, I've gone on record that it's so bad, we should just push into the sun. Um, people seem to have a problem with that. Fine, fine, okay. Venus can stay. Uh, how do we fix it? I mean, the honest answer is we don't. I mean, it's the worst, right? It's beyond hope. But if you want to fix Venus, okay, fine. Um, you just have to cool it down. You just got to put a sunshade that is goes in between Venus and the sun, you block all the heat landing on Venus, the planet cools down. And then all of that carbon dioxide sublimates out and just falls as snow. And now you just got Venus with a powdery layer of carbon dioxide snow mixed with sulfuric acid. And then you have to have some kind of chemical process that can lock up all of that carbon dioxide before you remove the sunshade and let it warm up again. Um, you need chemicals like magnesium or calcium to be able to lock up the carbon dioxide. Um, won't be easy. BM Woolgas, what is the farthest place from Earth that you predict humans will travel to before the end of the 21st century? The farthest place that I think humans will go to, I would say Mars. I think that before the end of the century, humans will have made it all the way to Mars. Um, I think that humans will, you know, will make it to Mars well before that. I mean, if Elon Musk has his way, we'll make it to Mars in about four years. Um, but let's say we take 20 years to get to Mars. So we make it to Mars in the 2040s. Um, there's nowhere else for humans to go beyond Mars, maybe an asteroid, but humans just aren't that useful on an asteroid either. And so even 60 years after that, I can't imagine uh, human beings going anywhere else in the solar system. Titan, maybe, but I doubt it. Maybe, but it's such a long trip. So uh, I, I think that Mars will be the farthest place and it won't take us long to get there. And then we won't go any farther than that. Um, 
I, and I even doubt that we'll go much farther than that ever. There's just like, just let the robots go out there and harvest the resources that you require and bring them back close to the sun. The, you know, as the farther you get from the sun, the less energy that you have to use and the more difficult it is to just survive. Uh, the outer solar system has the ice and the volatiles while the inner solar system has the sunlight and the metals. And so I think for, for human perspective, we're going to want to live in O'Neill cylinders. We're going to want to live in space stations. We're going to want to live on the moon and Mars, uh, maybe in orbit around Venus. Maybe there'll be a station at Mercury, some people at Mars. I can't imagine us going much farther than that, you know, uh, just to go. It's just, it's so terrible out there. And then again, maybe in the future, we'll become incredibly powerful. We'll have, we'll be able to trivialize the experience and then everything changes. Um, not Europa, not, yeah. So a couple of people are asking about Europa. I, I mean, Europa, you're standing on the surface of Europa and you're experiencing 1800 times more radiation than a person who's standing on the surface of the earth. That's bad. That's, that's a lethal dose of radiation all day, every day. So yeah, you could burrow into the ice on Europa and, and, and maybe try to do some science there. Um, or you could let your robots gather samples and bring them back into the inner solar system where you can test them at your leisure on planet earth. You send your, your Epstein probe to fly there with its fusion drive and gather samples. That's a expanse reference. Um, so, uh, you know, and then bring up, you know, fill, gather it full of samples and bring them back to the inner solar system where people are going to want to be able to look at them in their own lab. So that's, that's my feeling. It's just, I mean, but, I, but you know, never, you never know if really interesting things are found out there, then maybe, I mean, like if there was an alien space, an ancient alien precursor space station found uh, out in the asteroid belt, you can absolutely imagine that people are going to be sending a spacecraft out there to try and study it for sure. Um, all right. Matt John O2, would a replicator like device ever be possible? If so, do you think it would be enough to end scarcity on earth? Um, it's funny that you asked that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to create a challenge where, where robots would build more robots, sort of like an X prize, but, but a self replication, self replicating robot challenge where teams would try to compete and whoever could build a robot that could build the most of itself. Uh, would win with raw materials and the more raw materials they could start with or the more of the of itself it could make then then that would be the winning team. Um, so I think it's inevitable that that we will build I mean, when you think about a, a human being, a human being is a self replicating robot. Um, and we make more people we and you just all you have to do is just feed them food and they make another person. Um, animals are self replicating robots. So we know that nature was able to figure this out over the hundreds of millions and billions of years. You would think that we would be able to figure this out with our technology and be able to make a robot that can gather up all of the raw material, make a carbon copy of itself, make another carbon copy of itself, uh, ad infinitum, turn the entire solar system into self replicating robots that are making paper clips. Sure. Um, which makes you wonder where they all are. Where are all the self-replicating robots? If this is a thing, and like, I don't think it's going to take us long. I would say as the speed of, of 3d printing, um, additive manufacturing is increasing. I would say we will be capable of building a self-replicating robot within decades, right? for the end of the 21st century. And then it's really just a matter of, of 
exponentially letting them dismantle asteroids and turn them into more self-replicating robots. And so why don't we see self-replicating robots all the time? Uh, Palzerski, did Fraser just admit he wanted to end the universe with a paperclip maximizer? No, it's just, it just feels like it's the inevitable outcome is, is that we build paperclip maximizers. Um, so I, uh, I like, that's my, my, the most powerful for me response to the Fermi paradox is that we should see self-replicating robot probes everywhere. Um, and the fact that we don't makes me feel like we're alone in the universe because even if you don't want to build, even if you don't want to fill the universe with self-replicating robot probes, you have to expect that someone else is going to do it. So if we're not going to do it, let's say that we're the Federation and we're, uh, we just want peace and harmony and we just want to just get along. But someone goes, couldn't there be some kind of robotic species that assimilates everything and, and just grinds out replicating robes, robot probes nonstop, you know, we'll call them the Borg. And then you go, yeah, that is a problem. Well, what, what are we going to do about that? Well, let's build self-replicating robot probes to stop them so that they don't take over the entire galaxy. So no matter which way you go, you end up with self-replicating robot probes. And it's weird to me that we look out into the universe and we just don't see them. So, um, uh, that is my, that's my, that's my, that's why, like, if you get right down to it, the fact that we don't see robot probes everywhere is why I think we're alone in the universe. Um, <laughs> let's see. All right. Logic on abstraction. So if you say, I don't think we're going to send humans farther than Mars ever, does that mean that you do not think it's possible for a technological civilization to colonize star systems and planets? So you sort of got my previous response there, which is that I think that I don't think that we're going to send the meat to other star systems. I think that that it's a long and perilous journey. And you're going from a place that's great Earth to a place that is unknown. Uh, I don't know, Alpha Centauri, and it's going to take you generations to get the people there that it makes there's just like so many better ways send a robot send a DNA set a factory that can build life forms that can send, you know, that can take embryos. Um, so I can imagine ways that that people would or that civilizations would spread from star system to star system. But um, I don't anticipate that we in our current form as meet human beings will be the ones that make that journey. It just, it just feels t to me that we are, we're too close to whatever is going to happen next. And with our increasing technology, our advancing artificial intelligence, I mean, we have to get the artificial intelligence under control. Um, and there's no good reason to think that we will. Um, so, but even if we do like the, like the best case scenario is that we merge with our artificial intelligence and transcend this mortal coil. And I finally get my robot body and we head off into the cosmos, um, in, in robotic form that, that, and then of course, still once again, where are all the robots, you know, and then it's, you know, we are Legion. I am Bob. I am Bob. We are Legion. Anyway, um, uh, I am Legion. We are Bob. That's it. Yeah. And if you want to sort of see sort of how that works, I highly recommend that series um, as just a great way to talk about what it would be like to be a von Neumann probe. Um, S. Magnuson, wouldn't a Dyson society have the tech to hide their infrared signature? Either refocus it all somewhere specific and far away. 
Um, maybe. Uh, so the, so the idea is like people always ask me this question, which is like, like right now we could look out into space and we could see Dyson spheres because they will give off a very particular infrared signature. We would see that. Um, and so people say, well, couldn't it, like in a super advanced civilization just enclose their Dyson sphere in a way to trap the infrared radiation so it doesn't escape? Well, that's called an oven. And, you know, yeah, yeah, you can, you can live in an oven if you want, uh, but it gets uncomfortable after a while. You have to let the heat out. You have to let the heat into space. So I know what you're saying is like, could you like, instead of just releasing the infrared radiation in all directions, could you focus it into some kind of beam and then shoot that beam into a black hole or something? Maybe, uh, that's, uh, crazy. Sure. Um, maybe you could do that. That's pretty advanced stuff. So yeah, yeah, maybe the universe is filled with civilizations. There's actually dark matter is, um, is alien civilizations hiding in Dyson spheres, uh, throwing their matter into their pet black holes. But then why do we see some star systems? Like, isn't it weird that in every galaxy, the exact same percentage of alien civilizations always Dyson sphere up 80 or 15% of the stars in their galaxy and they leave 80 and then 85% is the dark matter Dyson civilizations. Uh, it seems weird. You'd expect different numbers in different galaxies, depending on how far along they are and why would they stop? So, um, so it's, uh, it's a tough thing to wrap your head around and, and think is the case. Uh, so cataclysm one, two, three, four Fraser, do you believe that there has been an alien life to exist within our universe from a probabilistic standpoint? Um, so, so my, and uh, you know, I'm, those of you who know my channel and, and most of you disagree with me and that's totally fine. I think it's great. Um, my, my feeling is that we are alone in the universe, that, that there is no life within the observable universe, that there is no life at all. Um, and I don't even think that there's bacterial life. Like I think that whatever happened to create life here on earth, was so rare that it happens once in an, in an observable universe. Um, and the reason is because of the Fermi paradox that, that if any civilization got started anywhere, then it would be self-replicating robot probes. And even if life, even if you could say, okay, well then simple life is everywhere, but complex life is the rare one. I can imagine scenarios that, that, that even simple life forms could gather together in ways that start to behave like more complex life. You can imagine a bacterial mat across an entire planet that acts like a primitive, like some kind of computer. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's my, that's my, uh, that's my feeling. Um, so I don't, th I personally don't feel like there's any life anywhere, but I think we should look, we should look everywhere. We should never stop looking. Um, Bim Jim is saying the Dyson sphere is a completely silly idea. Drop it. Bim Jim, we have already begun building our Dyson sphere. Think about all of the spacecraft that are orbiting the sun right now, gathering that solar energy and using it to do things. Um, uh, we have hundreds, thousands of satellites that are gathering solar power from the sun. They're blocking the light from the sun. They are, that is the beginning of the Dyson sphere. We have already begun. So to think that it's ridiculous is kind of, um, to fly in the face of the fact that our Dyson sphere is, is already, it's already started and it will continue. We'll just build one more thing after one more thing. Now we'll build a space station over here and a space station over there. And then we'll build a big solar array over there. And then we'll just layer them on one after the other until we've used up every single drop of radiation coming from the sun. It'll happen one, just like one day after the other. So, uh, you know, you say the, the, 
the Dyson sphere is uh, ridiculous. I see the Dyson sphere has already begun. And then how we'll see how far we get with it. It won't be a rigid shell. Like even Dyson said, it's not a rigid shell. It's a swarm. It's a, it's a collection of, it's a ragtag collection of satellites that are orbiting around the star that are gathering all of the usable radiation to put it to work. All right. Um, <laughs> Scott D. Whedon, what do you think will be the next profound archaeological discovery that is wrongly attributed to aliens? I don't know. Uh, if anyone attributes something to aliens, I would assume it's been done wrongly uh, until there's evidence that it's true. So I, w w whatever gets announced next. Um, you Tox Trader asks, what are Lorimer bursts, AKA fast radio bursts? So, I mean, are you asking what is the cause of fast radio bursts? I mean, we've talked about fast radio bursts. They are these brief flashes of radio waves that seem to happen outside of the galaxy. They happen one time. Occasionally they repeat and the evidence is really mounting now that fast radio bursts are connected to magnetars. Magnetars are the fresh um, remnants left over after a star much more massive than the sun explodes as a supernova and you get this exotic remnant. You know, the generic name is a neutron star, but uh, they can go into different varieties, magnetars, uh, neutron stars, pulsars, and they're all sort of flavors of the same thing. And it appears that there's some kind of mechanism that is happening on magnetars that is, that is releasing these large amounts of, of radio waves. It's l probably something like a, like a magnetic field reconnection, like what happens on the sun, like how we get flares off the sun when the magnetic field recombines around sunspots and you get this blast of radiation coming from the sun. It'll probably be something, I mean, that's sort of where the research seems to lead. So I think we're going to get an answer, a fairly definitive answer to what are fast radio bursts. You know, we may already have it or we're going to have it very soon. And the other, and this is like brand new. And the other thing that's pretty interesting is like just in the last couple of uh, weeks, we've also learned that magnetars are probably formed by a collision of two neutron stars. So um, when you get two neutron stars or two compact objects swirling into each other and combining, that might create the conditions that give you a, a neutron, uh, a magnetar. And so, so it's like two neutron, neutron stars colliding give you a magnetar, which is a type of neutron star. And then magnetars are the source of fast radio bursts is where this is kind of leading right now today. But um, it's, it's great. We have all these dilemmas, right? Like what is dark matter? What is dark energy? Why do we sleep? Where do socks go when you put them in the dryer? We don't, we may never know the answer to some of those questions, but, but fast radio bursts, which it's like came out of nowhere, super weird puzzle. Astronomers weren't sure where they were coming from. Are they coming? Were they a reflection from inside the solar system? Are they coming from inside the galaxy? Are they coming from outside the galaxy? Now it really looks like they're narrowing in on an answer and we should have it fairly soon, which is, which is wonderful. It's like quasars. If you go back and you watch Cosmos with Carl Sagan, he's like, what are quasars? We don't know. They're really bright. Maybe they're a black hole. Maybe there's something else. We don't know. But now we know. We know that they're, that they're actively feeding supermassive black holes, uh, which is wonderful. And so some of these mysteries get solved and others, it's going to have to be a future generation that will figure it out. Um, Jiro the Hero, do you think that we will control space junk or do you think that we will become trapped by it? I think that we will control space junk. Um, the, the modern constellations are the modern satellite constellations like Starlink, they have one big advantage over some of the older satellite constellations. And that's because they fly so low, they are pretty deep into the Earth's atmosphere. And so if they stop maintaining their propulsion system, they will just burn up into the atmosphere within a couple of years. So 
they'll clean themselves up. Um, but if the satellites fly any higher, then they can last for hundreds, thousands of years, crash into each other, create debris, and cause bigger and bigger problems. So we're never going to be trapped by space junk, but we are going to suffer losses from space junk. It's going to be, I mean, it's kind of going to be like like global warming. We're, we're not going to be wiped off the earth by global warming. We're going to just have to move our cities and deal with deal with all kinds of awful wildfires and, and flooding and hurricanes, and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And so the same thing with space junk. And so the sooner we can get this problem under control, uh, where you either only fly satellites at a very low altitude. And, and I like that idea because you know, it's sort of, I mean, as an astronomer, as an amateur astronomer, I hate Starlink because it puts streaks through my photographs. <laughs> I'm looking, you know, it's cool the first time and then it's not less cool after that. But I do like the idea of there not being space junk that lasts forever, that it all cleans itself back up within, within a couple of years, keeping farther space safer for us to be able to fly out and explore. And as long as people can organize the orbits that these satellites are flying in, so they're not crashing into each other. I think that's, I think that's terrific. And you think about things that we do right now at very high altitudes, like weather satellites and communication satellites and things like that. I wonder how many of those roles we could replace with low altitude. Could we have a GPS system that is at the highest? Could, could Starlink be a GPS system? Could Starlink be a weather system? Could Starlink be a, you know, a, a communications array beyond just providing us with internet? So I think it's kind of interesting um, uh, what the possibilities actually for lower flying. And you could fly even lower than that. There's these ideas of these air breathing ion engines, which I keep meaning to do a video on, where they fly even lower, like really low, like just a couple of hundred kilometers, where normally they would they would return into the atmosphere within months. But they're sucking in uh, particles from the atmosphere, they're using sunlight, because they're part of the Dyson sphere, um, to to accelerate those particles back out of the spacecraft, and they can remain aloft, but at a really low height which actually has all kinds of advantages. It's actually better for astronomy to have these satellites closer because they're not bright. They're not, they're not going, you know, they're not caught in the sunlight for the entire fly overhead and they can remain aloft forever without any propellant, which is great. So if people can really nail this technology, I wouldn't be surprised if we see all satellites using all earth based satellites, just using this, these air breathing, uh, technologies. It's pretty cool. Uh, Abby normal is saying, what about the Soviet satellite? They did collide with another piece of space junk. Yeah, there are problems There is pieces of space junk or satellites are crashing into each other and it is causing an additional risk. And it's just going to be, it's just going to make flying out into space a riskier and riskier process where you're going to send up your satellite and, oh, you know, it was in the wrong orbit and it got struck. And now it's debris has been added to the future risk. And now people are having to track more pieces of debris to, to find an, uh, an orbit that's safe. So I think it's, um, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, it's just a risk that goes up and up and up. And I think that people need to take responsibility for their rockets, for their junk, that, that they have to have a plan. Like we should have a, as part of some kind of international treaty, if you're going to launch something into space, you've got to have a plan for how you're going to bring it back down to earth. You've got to have a tether. You've got to have a propulsion system. You've got to have a way to make it to your orbit, or you are going to have to pay to have a starship go up and snap it out of space and bring it back down to earth. And Elon Musk will, will charge you for that service. All right. Um, so, uh, I mentioned this before, but, it, um, if I didn't get a chance to answer your question during the show, go ahead and just put it into the comments and hopefully I can just run through uh, in the, you know, in the text and I'll answer comments or I'll grab them for some of the, the next question show that I'm working on right now. So uh, go ahead and post in uh, 
in the comments of this video, not in the chat, because that just disappears forever, but post it into the into the, the actual comments of the video. Thank you, everybody for joining me today. Thank you for uh, the moderators who were uh, posting the questions so that I could read them, especially, of course, Nancy Graziano, I really appreciate all your help. Thank you so much. Um, got an interview with Chris Carr, who is one of the co hosts on the weekly space hangout. That's tomorrow at 11 Pacific. Um, and we're going to be talking about extra galactic astronomy, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about fast radio bursts and tidal tails and galactic collisions and the average temperature of the universe. So if you've got those big cosmology questions, Chris will be uh, the guy to talk to you about them. And then we've got a weekly space hangout this week. And of course, we've got astronomy cast on Friday, and then the virtual star party coming up on Saturday, hopefully. So thank you, everybody. That was a lot of fun. I always enjoy this. I like the live because um, I never know what we're going to talk about. It's so much fun. All right. Thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you all uh, next time. Bye, Cody. Oh, you missed it. <laughs>